when the government effects a new economy, it grants everybody a life pension with which to raise the standard of existence. It increases the value of everybody's property and raises the scale of everybody's wages. One of the greatest favors that can be bestowed upon the American people is economy in government. That's Calvin Coolidge preaching what he practiced. Um, over the years, his legacy has been tarnished. He is, um, he's a man really forgotten by most, and he should be the one that we are studying right now. Amity Schley, she is the author of The Forgotten Man. She has written a book called Coolidge. Hi, Amity. How are you? Hi, Glenn. Um, this is a, what a great follow-up to um, The Forgotten Man because it's really kind of, and I know it's, it's taking it out of, uh, out of order, The Forgotten Man shows us the problem, which is progressivism and giant government, and here's the solution. Oh, well, that's right. This is the prequel. Yeah. As in Star Wars, this is the prequel. So The Forgotten Man is how they broke it, and this is how they fixed it in the 1920s, uh, courtesy of the forgotten president, Calvin right. Coolidge. Um, so, so help me out because I look at Wilson and Barack Obama and I think they're the same guys. I mean, in many ways, they're exactly the same guys. They're doing the same thing. They're using the same tactics, same scapegoats, and, and we're getting the same kind of results. So how does somebody like Coolidge um, come in? Can somebody like Coolidge, where the American people have forgotten their own history and their own work ethic, how do you repair it? Uh, oh, I think they remember it. I mean, one thing is it'll get a little worse in our economy and we'll realize that we need a stronger president, won't we? I mean, that just happens uh, from time to time. Supposing our credit rating, for example, goes down, which might well happen. We'll start looking for a president like Coolidge. Um, I find, well, we didn't in the 1940s with, um, with FDR. With FDR, it's, it just kept spiraling downhill and, and it get worse and worse and worse and people would still look at that guy and say, you know, he's the answer. Coolidge actually went around and um, he tried to t tell the lion cub story because he tried to actually teach people the principles again in unique ways. Oh, well, thank you for asking. Coolidge loved tax cuts, and he was a sterling tax cutter, a gold standard tax cutter. His top rate was 25%, which is lower than Reagan's, for example. But he always did his tax cuts with budget cuts, and he had these lion cubs he got as a present from South Africa, and he named them budget bureau and tax reduction as twins in order to remind people that the two go together inexorably. You can't have tax reduction without budgeting. Okay. I like that very the, much. And, and, and that's really what the problem is now. We're saying, that they keep saying, well, we will have all, if we raise taxes, we'll have, the spending will go out of control. Well, of course it will, if you only do one of them. Well, that's right. And Coolidge was different from Reagan in that he really wanted to see them twin, like those cubs. The cuts and the cuts, right? Uh, and we can learn from that. But he also had great faith in growth, in economic growth. I, I mean, I, I think we're in a vicious cycle right now, Glenn, where nobody expects much from people, so they don't expect much from themselves. But as you know yourself, um, journalists aren't gods or priests. They're just people, and uh, they're sheep themselves, and we should follow them. We should heed our own common sense. Okay. That's my view. All right. So um, he also vetoed an awful lot. I mean, he used the veto like this president is using the executive order um, to where he came in and, um, uh, and vetoed almost everything that was coming through. Right. He vetoed substantively new entitlements. And we don't want to pretend they didn't have challenges and demands for entitlements. They had the veterans who wanted a pension, basically Social Security, and had a pretty compelling case for it. The veterans had worked hard in World War I. One-third were disabled in one way or another, a period with no antibiotics and no angiograms. They needed something. But Coolidge and Harding before him indeed said, no, we can't really afford to create a permanent entitlement. They didn't use the word entitlement, but that's what they meant. And likewise, farms. Coolidge himself, a farmer. I was just at Plymouth Notch, a very simple farming place with numerous challenges. And he just said when the farming subsidy people came to him, well, farmers never have made much money, have they? And I don't see we can do much about it. And therefore, he was able to keep the government small. 
And we tend to see that as inhumane, except the result was so very humane because the employment was below 5% much of the time. I mean, the unemployment, uh, um, the, the budget was in surplus. People got real wage increases without a minimum wage. The 20s were a great decade without government intervention and because of the absence of government intervention, in fact. Okay, now he was really popular at the time? He, and, and this ascetic austerity man, now we say austerity so bad, right? You can't win with austerity. Won every, just so many elections. Uh, the outstanding one we want to mention on television is that in 1924, when he ran for president, the progressives were doing pretty well, so they got 17% of the vote. These are the people who want to nationalize power, for example. Uh, yet Coolidge beat the progressives and the Democrats combined to win an absolute majority. So, so austerity could win, and in 28, when he chose not to run again, famous, famous moment, the uh, Republican Party just about had a nervous breakdown because they couldn't imagine anyone but him. Um, and they, and unfortunately, they went with a... Would you agree that Hoover was a progressive? I would, and I, in Forgotten Man, and you and I have talked about that, Hoover was the forgotten progressive. He was truly progressive and in many ways closer to Roosevelt who followed him. Right. So the thesis of Forgotten Man is that the sort of intervention habit that was destructive that made the Depression great started with Hoover. I was, I was struck by um, the, um, uh, the story, where was it, in Mississippi where the, where the flood happens and I was struck by the parallel really of of uh, Coolidge and what they said about him and what they really said about Bush with Katrina even though even though Bush did stuff Coolidge didn't but they said Bush hates black people and they said Coolidge because he didn't send any aid said he hates southerners right the, oh that's right um, yes it's hard for a president not to go to a disaster but sometimes there are reasons presidents don't jump to go to disasters, not even the way they'd go in a foreign capital during a war. It's because of their respect for federalism. And in the case of Coolidge, he really didn't want a giant new entitlement for infrastructure spending in emergency. Sounds very familiar, like today. And he knew if he went down as president, it would invite a stronger application for serious subsidy and in sort of infrastructure entitlement. So he didn't go, and he was much criticized. The lawmaker Thaddeus Carraway said, well, if it were your region, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially if it were his region, he'd have a special se session of Congress and perhaps go. And then there was a kind of retribution because indeed after the Mississippi flood to which uh, Coolidge did not go down, there was a terrible flood in his birth state, Vermont, and he could not go to be consistent. And he did not go and not all the Vermonters um, understood. He sent Hoover each time, but he was able to block the worst of infrastructure subsidies. So he was able to do what he said. He was a man of principle even when it caused him great pain. And that's why the story is so compelling in the, in the book, how, What I Discovered. How, how did he re remain, um, I guess it's just prosperity, I guess, but how did he remain popular? Because he, like, he never spoke. I mean, he, he really didn't, he didn't say anything. Well, people can appreciate someone who gets out of the way. They didn't have modern economic theory, so his theory was, if I get out of the way, you, you heard it in your wonderful clip you just showed, if I get out of the way, you'll have more freedom, and people saw that they did. And okay, so the, how, do we, how do we get there from here? I mean, here you've, you've done so much, you know, this is not, this is not a light book, and, and uh, you're not exactly a light, yeah, you're not exactly a light scholar. So as you look through this, you had to have seen the parallels, and is there a way out for us? What, what should we be doing? Oh, I do think there's a way out for us, and it starts with, I mean, I've written about you before. It starts with having alternate voices. This is very important. Um, it also starts, this sounds so tame, Glenn, but I believe in it with education in high school and college. I know what happens when you get the employees you get or when we meet the young people we met often. And they're not so well prepared in econ or growth. They're very well prepared in sort of obscure things. Uh, and I do believe uh, education is extremely important. I'm not just talking about school teachers, but uh, through I'm making a cartoon version of Forgotten Man. I think I told you that it's almost done. Good. Um, at the, I work with President Bush, the one of the flood, right? And we're having a national debate contest for high schoolers to debate economic topics, uh, varsity debaters. I think that's 
key that they get at least exposed to these ideas. And the other factor, more grim, is that the market will expose our country to the reality, which is our credit rating is too high, our interest rate is too low. And once interest rates go up, as they did in our adulthood, you know, in the 70s or 80s, people will realize they could do with a fix and be more attentive to alternate ideas like Coolidge's, won't they? Okay, so... Um because um, I, I want to show you respect, and I know you work with uh, President Bush, but I am done with the progressives in um, the Republican Party. And in some ways, President Bush was a, a progressive. Um, and how do, we, how do we untangle ourselves from, you know, get, let's, let's go with Gingrich, I think we'd both agree, is a big-time Republican progressive. How do we untangle ourselves from from this and get a do you see a pure Coolidge out there? Oh, I do. No, no. Uh, I w just want to say I work at an institute. I don't work for a politician. So it's like working at a think tank connected with a library full of documents because I'm a okay. historian, right? right. And I, I, I've seen nothing but m a great spirit from President Bush. He's very happy to hear the opposite of what he thinks. So he's right. fun to be around. Uh, so, but uh, w yes, I do think there are figures. There are many of the governors who are like that. I, I thought a little bit of Paul Ryan writing this, and I kind of would have liked personally to see him be number one and not number two as a candidate. Um, you see a little bit of in Mitch Daniels. This budgeteer, that's who Coolidge was. Uh, there are plenty of them in the United States. There are a lot of candidates at Ernst & Young, aren't there? Um, but we have taught ourselves they can't be political winners. I believe they can, that Americans respect that. Americans have an incredible sense of industry. When you ask a lot of them, they ask a lot of themselves. I will tell you that I think the uh, country, I don't know if you sense this yet, but I think the country is changing yet again yes, yes. Um, to where we are, we're waking up and we're seeing new solutions that, I mean, the whole point of this segment is new, there is no new, new solution. It's just an old common sense solution. Amity, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Glenn. You bet. The, <laughs> name, the name of the book is Coolidge, and it's available everywhere. Amity is really, truly one of the best history writers out there. Grab the book. You won't regret it. Back in a minute.